Alrighty, guys, what is going on? Welcome to the Bake Sale Episode 1. Why is it called the Bake Sale, Jay? I don't know, man. You came up with it. Because <laughs> <laughs> we got mad goodies in store for y'all. So, um, Or it's just strictly named after the Cool Kids, I think, first album. I don't know. However, but the, the Bake Sale sounds actually kind of cool. So basically, the premise of this, this is not going to be a podcast. It's just a video um video kind of show that we're going to do here together and it's going to be just a wide range of things you know hence the goodies you know it might be a review of a new album one day it might be a review of an old album it might be top 10 it could be anything discography talk just anything that we really kind of feel like we want to do at the time so uh but for episode one here we are going to be talking about the uh, brand new Pharaoh Monch project um that uh group project that he did with Derek Jones and um, and uh, Marcus Machado, who of course actually I, I couldn't even put the names together. I knew Derek Jones. I think he was part of like Jack White's band or whatever. He was a drummer and stuff. But um, both those yeah, guys. Yeah, if you're not if you're not familiar with Daru Jones, he's the dude that uh, plays his drums on an angle, like everything's all yeah. all tilted. Right. So I mean, he just does that basically for effect, and so people will notice him. Essentially, like there's no real specific reason for it, which I always thought was funny. Right, right. Uh, and yeah, it's a, a girl I know when he, he was on Saturday Night Live not long ago with Jack White. And uh, she asked me, he's like, why does he have his drums like that? Mm -hmm. I'm like, because exactly why you just you just wanted to know why his drums are like that. You noticed him, right? Right, right. It's like, yeah, it's kind of funny. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, Marcus Machado, I didn't really recognize the name too much. And then I put the two together and they both are part of uh, Pete Rock's uh, The Soul Brothers um group that he recorded with for the peace terminals three uh instrumental record did you listen to that at all because both of them they, they both play on that and stuff so yeah yeah with with him like i didn't think he was the right man for this job basically because i really like the drums sound awesome on this album perfect like perfect sounding drums yeah and i like i like for a munch but for what they were trying to do i just didn't think that marcus machado is the right type of player for this project okay um, see, again, I don't really have a lot to base off of, so I was just going off the sound that was on the record and stuff, but I do agree, though, the drums on here, Pharaoh Monch really did go out of his way, because he wanted a drummer that could play, obviously, hip-hop loops and drums and stuff, and make it sound like that, because, essentially, the core of this project is, you know, it's a rap record mixed with, you know, the influence of 70s rock, right? So, the forefront is Pharaoh Monch's vocals and the, and the hip-hop drums and stuff over this kind of distorted kind of you know guitar tracks and different sounds and different things that they're kind of trying to create and stuff so you know for myself um you know getting into kind of our overall thoughts on the record i think it's uh it's a really interesting album sound wise again we we brought up the drums and i think the drums are just from track to track are phenomenal like the the, the programming and you know the way they did them and just the sound so the way it's mixed too it's great the, the sounds are awesome they yeah. really do come off sounding like this is a rap record, you know, these drums are in this rap record, but it kind of fits into this, you know, this kind of rock element too, which I think it really stands out. It really does. I mean, I find myself listening to drums in a lot of shit I listen to anyways, drums and bass lines and stuff and, and mixed with Faro. And that's pretty much what the, the biggest standout moments are on this. I think there's some, there's definitely some guitar loops and stuff on here that I feel like, you know, it, it's, you know, I mean, I get what they were going at. They didn't quite need to go into certain places and breakdowns but i don't think it's overdone either i don't think that they overutilized and, and try to distort it out too much and, and take that element of what they were trying to do and overpower it with the rock elements and stuff i you know going into this project i knew what feral munch was kind of getting kind of letting people know what he wanted to do and stuff because he announced this about three years ago and i was intrigued i was like that's really cool that he's finally doing a project what he, how he grew up because you know he's a little bit older and he grew up on 70s rock and stuff and i was like okay what is this really going to sound like and you know this is kind of what i was thinking you know but you know i i think it worked for the most part for the most part pretty pretty damn well so what are your thoughts on the record well i i listened to some interviews with uh pharaoh after i listened to it a couple times and uh, he was trying to explain it as like this like aggressive sound like a super aggressive and and uh, the guy asked him, is it kind of like Prophets of Rage, which, of course, is Chuck D and Be Real with Rage Against the Rage Machine, against machine musicians. Yeah. 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 And he said, nah, it's more like more like Rage Against the Machine. So I was like, OK, well, they're pretty similar, but both very aggressive. And 
you know, very groove oriented with heaviness involved. Right, right. This album doesn't. This album doesn't have that. Like, no, it's nothing like Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> no, see, Rage so. Rage has a more consistent overall uh, met, kind of rock sound throughout the riffs and stuff, and the arrangement of the music is a little bit more rock oriented. Where this one is, it's broke down to more of a hip hop element with you know, certain breakdowns of, of rock in with the guitar and stuff like that. There's a little bit of solos and there's a little bit of end in, in the songs, but I wouldn't say the overall product is an aggressiveness. It comes off as being, no. see, I think, I think the more aggressiveness that when he, cause I think I know when interview you're referring to too, when I hear him say aggressive, the first thing that comes to my mind is the, is the politicalness and the message in the music. That's where the aggressiveness comes out because I mean, you you look at this album and he wrote this over like the last seven, eight years. So if you listen to the lyrics and you break it down a little bit, like, I mean, he talks about everything from Obamacare to, you know, to obvious the Trump stuff, like it's over, it's written over a span. So there's a lot of anger involved here. And that's where I think the most aggressiveness to the record is not in the music at all. Yeah, that's, that's not the way it came across when he was saying it, though. He, he was saying it's going to be very aggressive sound. Yeah. That's, not, not just his lyrics. Like, yeah. And that def, definitely, I, that's what I was thinking is maybe at that point, that was his expectation. Mm -hmm. But right. with these musicians, particularly Marcus Machado, I don't think it turned out that right. way. He's more of a blues player, right? He's like... Right, right. And so, yeah, I, I just don't, I don't know. It seemed like an experiment. And I've been in bands like in the same situation, like you have an idea, but when you get everybody that's in, in it together, it doesn't turn out to be that idea. It turns into something else. Oh, absolutely. I think, so, the, I think when you have a vision for something, you know, it always turns out maybe at the most 75, 80% of what your actual vision is, you know, like, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think, it, I mean, I think if you was thinking it was going to be a little bit more aggressive and stuff, it probably would have came across to us as being that. But like I said, you know, I agree. I think the music itself is not that aggressive. I think the more aggressiveness that I see in it is more of the, of the, uh, the voice in it from, um, yeah. from Pharaoh, not the music, which is interesting yeah. how he describes it, the polar opposite, but we see it differently, which we totally agree. I totally agree with that. I mean, yeah. like I said, you know, read off what we said, Pharaoh's aggressiveness in his lyrics and stuff. And his, um, just the way he spits his words, like he changed up his flows and he comes at you so strong in this record and stuff, but it's, you know, you, you find yourself really listening to those very distinctive, um, you know, drum hip hop loops and shit you know the drums are so hip-hop in this man it's like it just doesn't oh, yeah. come across as being very aggressive and stuff but um yeah it, it's pretty interesting yeah and daru jones is known for his work with hip-hop artists so definitely a top-notch drummer to have on this for sure and like i said man the drums sound perfect like, oh it's it couldn't get any better sound wise for me no it really is good man like right from the opening track dude like you just you hear that drums right away and you're just like oh fuck yeah and there's some really good bass yeah. licks on here and stuff too like you know going to the overall production on the record like i heard feral munch talking on uh take it personal recently about the record and obviously talking about daryl jones and marcus machado and the band and stuff and he didn't really break down everybody that was involved he did mention knots who definitely yeah. was part of this i couldn't actually find the the full production credits on this and, and he mentioned marco polo and that they were big influences on the record too so i'm not 100 yeah. percent sure what songs they fit into or what their what their um, yeah. part was in creating the music too because i mean obviously you know working with Derek jones as a drummer i mean he's a he's a musician he can program and play drums and and help out with that you know you're writing the music yeah. like that right so i was kind of curious on what yeah. knots and marco polo actually did in the record but i guess we'll have to wait for the physical yeah, yeah yeah exactly i was as well because i was saying okay it's a it's a band it's a group like of course you're gonna have, have producers involved but it just seems funny that you would have hip-hop producers involved with it kind yeah, of i know to me but, yeah i, I yeah. thought it was very interesting because the album does sound very cohesive like you know it sounds like these guys made this record it doesn't really sound like there's a lot of outside influence from you know marco polo yeah. and like who's who's a magnificent producer and stuff and same with knots too like oh, those yeah. guys are really great yeah. at programming drums and things like that but i mean when I listen to it, I'm like, that's not Knotts and Marco Polo's drums, <laughs> you know, it's no. like at all. Daru Jones drums. <laughs> right, right. So, I mean. He's the, actually playing the shit. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. I mean, so, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, anything else you want to say about the record? You know, before we kind of, I, I think we'll probably get into, I, I don't even think we even said the name of the, the name of the record. Of course, the project group name is 13, and the album is called A Magnificent Day for an Exorcism, which 
I think it's really cool. I like the whole premise of the name 13, of course, obviously is it's a study, you know, it's, he has a whole song about it. You know, the track, yeah. the second track on the album is uh, uh Trisodectophobia, which is basically, you know, the superstition and the fear of the number 13 and stuff. And it's repeated throughout the album. He's got similar themes of, you know, going to the album title magnificent day for an exorcism, which he actually saw has a song called uh, exorcism on the record, which, it's actually quite an interesting metaphor for what he's trying to say. So the group name mixed with the album title is pretty interesting, but there's a lot of things, you know, covered on this record from, you know, he talks about the drone warfare to Obamacare. to like, he's ripping on Trump and, you know, the very first song called Colt 45, of course, you know, yeah. you know, that's obviously Trump who was the 45th pre- president and stuff. And, you yeah. know, th- there's a song called Oxygen on this record where he doesn't actually mention George Floyd's name by name, but you can tell the song is definitely very, very much influenced by what happened to George Floyd. And of course, it's, the song is also a big metaphor for the bigger picture of everybody is gasping for oxygen in the society, you know, of this corruptness and stuff like that. But I mean, you know, the political yeah, when corruptness. When I saw that song title, I thought that it might be something to do with his asthma, but it ended up being something totally different. Dude, that's so. crazy. See, I didn't even think of that because I didn't even, you know, I've even heard him talk about that, his asthma. I didn't even think about that until you brought yeah. it up. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, that's the first thing I thought when I saw that title. Oh, this is going to be about his asthma and dealing with it and shit. But, but yeah. you never know because, you know, Feral Monch is known for rapping from the point of view of something specific like asthma. You know, like yeah. on, on Brooklyn's story on the fight song, he raps from the point of a disease and stuff like him and Mass Dace and of course on, um, um, yeah. uh, what is it, Gun Spray? No, what's the song? Yeah, off the stress record. Anyways, Stray Bullet, Stray Bullet. That's the one we raps stray from. Bullet, the, yeah. yeah, so he raps from the point of that and stuff. And the so, same as this one with the Triskaidekaphobia, that's like he's sort of like the taking the position of 13. Of, of the, the number, number 13. Yeah, so, he raps from the yeah. point of view of number 13. So yeah, so hearing tracks like that, I, I wasn't overly surprised that he was coming vocally from you know that point of view and stuff. But, you know, I mean, this, going into the record, I knew just from hearing interviews and stuff what he was going to be bringing to the table here, all the social re- le- relevance of like, you know, political political corruption, uh, police, uh, police brutality. Um, I think it's really interesting. He, he kind of, he kind of alludes to like the algorithm effect on society and stuff like that too. Just how, you know, the bigger and more famous people have more of this voice right now and everyone that's trying to slip in there yeah. and get a voice. It's kind of like, it's kind of like you and me on YouTube having small YouTube channels and stuff like the algorithm has fucked us so bad now that like, I can't even, there's no, even if I wanted to gain a ton of subs, I probably could never do it because the algorithm plays to the bigger channels and stuff. It's, it's actually very notable and it, it's pissed off a lot of people within this community that they've left they're like fuck i can't get subs and shit you know i can't get views but it's not like it was before the algorithm is but you know the the metaphor of algorithm in the in society is is pretty cool to talk about and stuff so um, yeah but i think it's really cool because i you know i come and I, you know, I love, you know, dark arts and stuff and, you know, you know, him talking about the study of 13 and, you know, just the, the pagan rituals and satanic rituals and number 13 pertaining to what bad luck and witchcraft voodoo rituals and everything he brings up on here. It's, it's the overall tone of the record is so dark because he's coming from, and we're also living in these dark ages too. And I love that. I love that he didn't try to downplay anything. He used these metaphors and these type of things in a non-literal literal sense and, you know, incorporated into mm. what we see and what we, and how we're living and what everybody is, you know, trying to, you know, accomplish these days and stuff and it, within society. And it's really cool. I think it's, it, you know, it, I didn't really expect anything else from Pharaoh Mons. His metaphors are incredible. I mean, you could probably go through the lyrics a hundred times and still try to decipher his shit, man. It's like, it's like college worthy. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he has a very good voice, a very interesting voice. He has a lot of inflection that would work with stuff with music like this. Uh, even with heavier music, I think he can definitely pull it off, but I kind of wish it was heavier personally, but you know, at times I do too. Th- okay. What are your thoughts on some of the courses that he sings? Like, I mean, he doesn't overdo it with the course singing. There's a little bit of, yeah. um, you know, bridges and stuff that he kind of harmonizes and he, he sings a little bit and stuff. I don't think he overdid anything in that aspect, but it was cool that he was trying to like bring out that, that element of the rock music that he was trying to accomplish by doing these things. Like he wasn't getting other people to do these courses and these bridges yeah. and stuff. Like he was doing it himself. Like he was, he yeah. was really involved with all the vocals on this. And I thought that was really interesting choice because, you know, when you look at the uh, features on the record, it's just, it's fucking Cypress Hill. It's be real and send dog really on the record yeah. on fight, which I thought was a brilliant choice to have be real on there because, you know, for, for obvious reasons, I mean, be real, obviously it's super political and stuff, but he also is, 
been a very big advocate of you know fuck the police in the past you know was, you know so it was yeah. it kind of went hand in hand to have him on that track too so yeah that was and he likes cool. the rock type shit so and exactly yeah. and that's the other thing too is that you know uh, be real and you know they've done a lot of rock records and stuff like that too the skull and bones and shit they did i think a whole fucking ep that was all rock and shit so yeah, yeah. and even with prophets of rage when he does uh, when they do covers of the rage against the machine songs like he does Zach's parts very well. Like he sounds really good doing them. So right, right. It's definitely, definitely a good choice to have features of Cypress Hill on there. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, if you want to just run through the tracks and break them down a bit, yeah, thoughts, absolutely, absolutely. Just, just quick, we'll just run through some quick thoughts on. Okay, this. yeah. So basically, the first track on the album is called "Cult 45." And when I first saw the title "Cult 45," I thought it was a play on "Cult." The beer yeah. for 45 and then i realized i was like no trump, trump. is the 45th president <laughs> hence his cult 45 i'm like oh dude it's like a double play in my mind it was like a double play on words i was like oh that's actually really cool yeah. <laughs> so yeah this song the, the beat on it's really airy like it, oh, it, it kind of it didn't it didn't uh i wasn't expecting that at all like to start the record off i was expecting right. something pretty pretty heavy and banging but it's like jesus what is what are we getting into here but uh yeah yeah it's a, it's a pretty cool song though it almost feels like an intro track but like you're right the beat is so unexpected because again going into the album i was expecting the album to be a little bit more heavy and just the way he described it too so this you know this very eerie drum loop over this like very melodic lyrics and shit and like he's just he comes off blazing in this like he's not even fucking around in this man i actually have the lyrics right up here but like i love the way he starts starts off the track and he's like chop the head off of false idols topple the status set him ablaze t donald make ronald reagan turn in his grave <laughs> i love that shit man I'm like yeah that's just fucking great dude it just sets the tone but man dude again going back to the overall tone of the record being so damn dark talk about setting the stage perfectly because i feel that never really strays away from that at all you know and that aspect of that type of tone that the record that they were trying to go for with the tone um you know i'm not talking about the overall music i'm talking about the tone of the record right, they right. stood yeah. very much intact right from the start to yeah. i would say pretty much the finish we'll get there but i think the last two tracks to me you know, I think that they, it, it kind of lost a little bit of steam for myself. I think if it had ended at track 11, it would have been a perfect length for yeah. record. And it just, it would have kept that whole thing. I think it kind of, kind of lost its uh, appeal a little bit at the end, but, um, but Cult 45 is a cool track though. And I think it's a really interesting, perfect song to start off the record. And it goes into track two, which is, which we mentioned before, which is uh, uh trace phobia, however you want to pronounce it. Um, which of course is you know the fear of like the number 13 and stuff which is a very prevalent theme throughout the record and stuff but man dude like he's just fucking spitting on this shit man like i i love this is like vintage faramanch to me man you know again rap rapping yeah. from the point of the view point of view of like you know, you know the number 13 and shit like that but it's just again you know this one comes off as this is very very hip hop you know you know what i'm saying like it's it doesn't yeah. come across as being that aggressive type shit it's very eerie and it's it's a cool concept yeah. to rap from the number 13 you know it's just bad luck you know yeah and the beat the beat on this is really a sparse beat the drums carry it for sure and uh, i kind of like the singing the chorus as well it's kind of like a lazy singing feel but it's pretty good. That's what I was saying about him in, in the, you know, the bridges and the courses and stuff. Like he doesn't really try to overdo it. I felt like he, it's a really mellow track again, which is yeah. interesting that, that, that they started off the album with cult 45 and, and, and Trista Decophobia because the songs are very mellow, you know? And again, yeah. and you were probably going, where the fuck is all the rock? Where's all the metal on this record? Right. And then he well, starts, yeah, and mean, then he like starts singing. You have the live musicians like that. And you're expecting something totally either, either you're going the route of the roots Right, like you know, like it's more traditional hip hop sounding or soulful, or you're going heavy side. And mm -hmm. I, I was thinking this was going to be more heavy, just based on you know mm -hmm. expectations and the way Feral Munch raps, basically. Like, but yeah, he pulled this off for sure, though. Right, right, and that was one of my favorite things about this track too, is that he you know takes a stab at you know singing the chorus. We get a kind of a feel for what he's going to do in that aspect, and you know it still yeah. comes across as being very almost soulful in an eerie fucking way it's very mellow like he doesn't yeah. overdo it it doesn't take away from any, anything and he you know he spits a couple verses of this and it's like it's just a really overall trippy track <laughs> honestly yeah. like for lack of a better adjective it's a trippy song 
right? Yeah. The music in it is trippy. So pretty cool stuff. And um, then we get into track three, which is called The Magician. Um, this track right here is definitely a switch up big time from the previous two tracks. Like, I mean, this one, you know, of course, it's got some really, really amazing uh, words being ripped by Pharaoh in here. But man, I couldn't help. But <laughs> this track, I couldn't help just hear the influence of Jimi Hendrix in this song, man, like him screaming voodoo and shit. I was just like, this is Jimi Hendrix, man. And I, it was like a combination of like X clan yeah, and, and the like guitars, the guitars going in the background and shit. But, right. Like it's got this yeah. like total, like Jimmy kind of, and then him doing the voodoo thing. And I, I kept thinking Jimmy and X clan the whole time I'm thinking of this track, <laughs> right. It's just got this really kind of totally different type of influence in the song. Like it's more of a, it does have more of the heavier guitar um, influence in it you know than the previous tracks and stuff so yeah i didn't really like this song at all really except for pharaoh i liked him and when he in the second verse he flipped it up and was rapping super fast uh, it was pretty cool but yeah i didn't i didn't really feel this track musically at all yeah and no the, the bass sound bass sounds weak man they need a they need some bass in there is what they need mm -hmm. they need a good bass player <laughs> right right i'll take the job i'll take that job <laughs> yeah i mean again lyrically this is man he just absolutely annihilates this shit man there's some really really yeah. good like hard hard lyrics in this but i feel you man because when i first heard it i was like oh that's pretty cool but i've listened i listened to the album you know eight nine times this week and stuff and th this is the yeah. one track that i always felt myself not going back to you know a little bit yeah. it just it kind of didn't work with the arrangement of the guitars and stuff like that it just it just came off as being a little bit i don't know man almost I don't even want to say over aggressive, but it just doesn't, the sound of it doesn't really work properly for, yeah. for what it was, what was going on in it and stuff. But, but yeah, again, man, like really, that. really, really dope lyrics though, man. Like lyrically, yeah. it's super fucking sweet, man. Um, yeah. But again, I was just like, I couldn't stop listening or hearing like Jimmy influence. And this is kind of, it was, <laughs> always makes me laugh, but um, yeah, for sure. You know, he's got like, I just, you know, the song basically kind of sums up by saying like, I have a gun who's going to listen, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, lyrics wise, it's like basically a school bully guy getting bullied and you yep. know, taking care, you know, taking it from there. So, yeah. right. I, I like the fact that he touched on, you know, the whole school shootings and things like that and stuff. And yeah, there've uh, been a lot of those type of songs in hip hop, man. Like a lot of people have done those, but this one's definitely interesting lyric wise. Yeah. There was a movie last year that was really, really popular <clears throat> um, called spontaneous. And uh, it was, you know, it was on a couple lists. Yeah, I heard you guys talk about that. Yeah. On the podcast. It, it's not yeah. really like the movie. It's like the message in the movie was really cool because, you know, the undertones of it are, it's basically about kids that are, getting infected with something and literally spontaneously combusting they're exploding and nobody yeah. like nobody knows what's going on there's no virus that's out like prevalent that's causing these kids to do that and stuff and and then, and then they try to figure out why these kids are exploding and shit and i think the the message of the movie is basically it's about school shootings it's the spontaneous you know comes out of left field and this is what kids live in fear with every single day in their school systems it's like you could die at any moment hence you just spontaneously combusting so it, it's a really yeah. it, it's one of these movies where it's kind of crazy because like people are like oh it's not really horror but it's literally people exploding and shit because it comes across as like a tearjerk it's really good character development and stuff but it's cool that these things are being explored and you know horror movies have always been super political and super uh, social consciousness about things that are going on and stuff but that you're seeing these things develop into hip-hop and stuff and see the correlation which is really cool because it needs to be it needs to yeah. be out there and people need to understand that these are big big fucking problems you know instead of just exploiting it on the fucking news you know hence fox and cnn and shit they just ratings yeah. dude ratings ratings they don't care you know yep. it's fuck but there's people dying out there and for no reason so it's kind of yeah. savage so um but yeah you know not definitely not my favorite song on the album by any means uh but getting into probably probably just kind of not really pre-thinking about it but this might even be my favorite song on the album it's called six 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 three six word stories um Right yeah, away, the Black Sabbath remix, dude. I know. I right away, dude. I was like, oh my god, is that is that the Hands of Doom cover? And it turns out, yeah. I had to go read the story on it. I was like, they had kind of interpreted the song, and Black Sabbath actually heard it and stuff, and they gave their blessing on it after they told them what the theme of the the song they were doing because they actually thought that they had they were just sampling their song. They did it so yeah. good, <laughs> and so yeah. I was like, wow, kind of kudos to these guys, right? But um, yeah, it's pretty cool. So I thought that was really cool. And one of my favorite, just it's super dark, like that cut, like they do it really, really 
oh, it's just a dark ship. But what really kind of separates this track from myself is the the whole idea of using the three six word stories, which is is a tribute to Ernest Hemingway. And I remember doing studying Ernest Hemingway in high school and in college because I was an English degree too, right? And so I knew right away what the what the six word story thing was. And it's this, it's actually a method for writer for writers. And basically what it is, it's to tell a story within six words. Right. And I was like, oh, yeah. cool. And so I read into it and I was like, it actually was a tribute to Ernest Hemingway. And he does it in here. And I was like, oh, that is so fucking cool, man. So they're not yeah. only doing like a Hands of, Do- uh, Hands of Doom by Sabbath, but they're also doing this Ernest Hemingway kind of tribute thing. And I was like, this is a really, really inventive, cool track, man. Yeah. Yeah. Like usually with songs like that, like covers of other bands and bringing it into hip hop elements, I really don't follow along with those but this mm-hmm. actually worked out i thought this did work out pretty well everything sounded really nice is yeah right, definitely right. good and of course like pharaoh's the the star of the track like usual but oh dude like honestly man like the the lyrics in this shit man is crazy like he he yeah. does break it down like he when I was listening to, it, I was kind of waiting for him to do like the three, six thing, but it's more at the end of the, it's more at the end of the track where he goes, I breathe like oxygen is, is expensive. Don't be offended. I am defensive. I love you. Take care and intensive. So basically those three lines right there, six words a piece, right? So that's where yeah, he kind he of break- repeats, repeats the last line as well at the end. Yeah. So I love cool. you. Take care intensive. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So I remember, I remember actually kind of doing, you know, exercises writing like that and at first it seems so damn hard to do but then you realize that it really does kind of exercise your brain to write like that and stuff so pretty cool yeah. pretty cool concept for a movie and um actually I forgot to mention earlier i can't remember what track it is it is is it in is it in cult 45 he actually mentions nova scotia in that track i think too i thought that was kind of interesting uh, yeah that was uh the second track I think. oh is it trace uh, addictive folk? yeah okay Okay. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't catch exactly what he was saying there. It, it said something about Nova Scotia in the dead of winter. I did, I did, but I don't know exactly what it was. So yeah, props for him to bring up Nova Scotia, though, for sure. Okay, so here it is. So oh yeah, they even bring up Strable. Okay, so yeah, I I took I took her that my look was something as Nova Scotia in the dead of winter. I'm a passive assassin. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I'm not really too sure exactly what he says there, but he does mention it. And I just I was thinking of you. Um, <laughs> in this track too, because he actually brings up uh, Mookie Betts. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Which I thought was kind of a almost like a sore spot right now for you, I guess, a little bit. Yeah. But but you just yeah, being well. such a big Boston fan, and I first thing I thought of was like, oh, Mookie Betts. Uh, Dodgers are my West Coast team, though, so I'm all right with that. Of if course, man. Any, if you had to go anywhere, it's good to go to the Dodgers, right? So. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um yeah, really really cool track, man. I love the I love the verses on that, man. He just he spits it too, but man, it's just again, it's super dark, it's catchy, it's it's just a really well done and thought out track, you know. It's pretty cool shit. Yeah. So um next up is track five and it's called Goat's Head. Uh what'd you think of this song? I actually like this one. Yeah, dude, this one is cool, man. This this is a yeah. really fucking cool track, man. I, I think it's really inventive to you know, basically call yourself the greatest of all time, but at the same time kind of throw jabs at others that call themselves the greatest of all time by not yeah. really saying anything to it's everything super subtle in the track. <laughs> I love that yeah. aspect, man. It's kind of cool. And, and the way he set it up, it's kind of almost like a blues rap type song, right? It's because the, he say, it's hard for me to pay these bills. It's difficult for me to write these rhymes. Right. <laughs> right. 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 And, and the, it does have, have kind of a blues feel to it. And I definitely thought like, uh, Machado's guitar style on this it definitely fit this type of track much better the guitars in this one for me yeah so. absolutely see I, di- I didn't really know that he had much, that kind of blues background but now that you mention it but that's that's cool having you on here you know to to notice shit like that because I wouldn't even have put that together um, yeah that, that's pretty cool though now when I hear it again I'm like oh that's pretty co- that's pretty interesting but I love the way this yeah. this song starts out like see rumor has it I use the f word a lot fuck you shut yeah. the fuck up and I was, yeah it just sounded like he was having a good time on this like he was having fun then later on it's with the stuff like that right so yeah yeah right fun. right yeah no you can you can tell throughout this record though that Pharaoh Monch still loves to spit rhymes right because some yeah. of the different flows and and some of the wordplay and just some of the things like you can feel the energy coming out of him and shit like that and and like right here he's almost being comical with that with the way he starts out the song and and stuff right but like you know he's still he's still bringing the noise and he's still taking these jabs and stuff and like 
I don't know, man. There's yeah. there's just some really cool shit, man. Like they pop pills and use syrup. I use syrup to pill pickpockers and pop toast, and it's just crazy the way he's fucking spitting this shit, man. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. and then he says, like, uh, what do you say? Like, this year I'm going to be the fucking man. Uh. It's like, it's funny. There's funny accents and shit on this, too, right? He's like, yeah, yeah. It just sounds like like he was having a lot of fun on this. So, yeah. I definitely like this track, though. See, this is the type of track that he, you know, in a sense is like, because he's not the type of person that calls himself the GOAT. Like, I mean, other people associate yeah. him with being a GOAT of hip hop, right? So yeah. he takes that from other people, but his jab on others is like, you know, and he, he, he kind of, he's kind of alluding to the fact when he's talking about, you know, the down South syrup and shit like that and all these mumble rappers. Cause he will, like when he's on radio shows and stuff talking, he'll be like, what is that guy? Like MC butt fuck spit mumble shit. And he's just, he keeps going on, but like, and you know exactly where he's coming from when he's like, these guys are fucking, you know, hip hop is about spitting words and, and getting, you know, those, the voice out yeah. there. But if you're mumbling, what the fuck do you got? A shitty yeah, ass the beat. thing is, man, it's been so long since he's put on. What's it like six or seven years since he put out an album? So he's probably had so many thoughts and like so many rhymes build up. It's like, yeah, he just wants to release the stuff, right? So yeah, and what was it? Was his last record uh, PTSD? Was that the last PTSD? Album? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. which was a cool album because that yeah. album was a concept record basically on mental illness and like you know, yeah. which is kind of interesting that he was exploring that. And then he did the fight song with Mass Ace, which was basically like, it was like an yeah. excerpt from this themed record that he did a couple years prior, which is really cool. So yeah, yeah, he, he's really in tune with, you know, all that type of shit, man. Fur Munch is the fucking man, dude. Oh, yeah. it's pretty cool. But yeah, I, I, Goat's Head, I really, I really enjoy the song, man. Like, you know, he, yeah. sing, he sings the chorus in this track too. And I think it, um, you know, to me, the chorus almost came off sounding a little bit of CeeLo ish not as like extreme CeeLo but never could, thought of that but yeah but I can kind of yeah. hear it a little bit you know it's not like that great like you know CeeLo when you hear CeeLo you fucking know CeeLo right like this one yeah. just kind of felt like it was in that realm of like a CeeLo type chorus and I was like oh, that's pretty cool actually because I love CeeLo yeah. so <laughs> but uh yeah. yeah so that's go said uh into track six is a track called Scarecrow um what did you think of this song at first I hated it but I don't know something about it. Just the way on the yellow brick, I'm on the yellow brick. Just after you listen to it a bunch of times, it kind of gets catchy. Like you can't, you, I just keep thinking of it on the yellow brick, <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of funny. I didn't mind it after a while, but yeah, at first I hated this song. It definitely grew on me. Yeah. This one actually grew on me too. I didn't hate it at first, but I, I was trying to like make sense of the song. Cause I, I knew like, yeah. you know right away i'm like scarecrow and then all of a sudden he's, he's mentioning the yellow brick road and i'm like oh this is a wizard of oz and then he's like toto scarecrow yeah. tin man lion i'm like yeah. holy shit but i think i think the song because the yellow brick road kind of signifies like you know good stuff you know like good you know happiness and things like that good and happiness and you know you're going to the yellow yeah. brick road kind of thing and i think the song itself is super ironic I think that's the irony yeah. of it, right? Because it's, everything's not happy and everything is not yeah. yellow brick road kind of thing, right? And again, you know, yeah, it's exactly. it's a simple metaphor, but it's but it's but it works because yeah, I love irony. Irony is funny to me. You know, he's not trying to be overly funny here. He's trying to be clever, but it's um, but it comes off exactly how it's supposed to be. And he's, it's just uh, it's great, man. It's great. It's great stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I liked it after I listened to it a bunch of times. So. It's an interesting one. I would like to hear other people's thoughts on that song as well, because uh, I heard him telling a story where I think it was, who was it, Common and and might have been Talib Kweli were listening to it. And they just, this was like a year and a half ago, I think he said. Oh. He just, they said, just throw on something from the new project. We want to listen to it. And they were, they were blown away by it, I guess, which is kind of surprising to me. Crazy. But, yeah. This was the song that he showed them. Yeah, he <laughs> just said play play something off the new project, and this was a while. But like you said, it was like a year and a half ago, I think. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and and they they were just blown away by it. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I Which, guess a year and a half ago. I mean, he had to show them something that he had done, kind of thing. Yeah. Right? So I don't know what he had done and stuff like that. But yeah, no, Scarecrow is an interesting track. It's uh, it's a little slower. It's not as like up tempo yeah. and stuff like that as you think it was. Um, you know, it's got that. It's got that. Uh, oh man, his. I mean, it's got that kind of pure kind of rock value to it and stuff like that. But man, second yeah. verse is fucking crazy on this track, dude. Like he just, yeah. he rips this one. So it, like the words are just nuts. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, 
but interesting track nevertheless again you yeah. know just like 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 you said it didn't really hit home at, at, with me first either but i didn't hate it though but um the very first song off the album i heard was the next song track seven which is fight featuring of course cypress Hill, uh be real and send dog uh be real does have a verse on it and send dog does the um you know does the chorus and stuff um and the yeah, ad-libbing and shit like that as as he usually does i mean this song is pretty self-explanatory it's you know it's 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 a protest song they're fucking pissed off you know because the shit just keeps coming back around and you know the voices aren't being heard and stuff and you know i like this song because they didn't really try to beat around they went straight to the fucking point you know everything that's said in this song is just it's face value i i like that after you can try to decipher every song prior to this and it's like this pure anthem like stand the fuck up we're pissed off fuck you cops fuck this fuck that and it's like and it comes off quite well actually i was quite impressed when i first heard the song i was like okay that actually completely works to have be real on this track i was like i was so impressed with having that one feature if you're gonna have one feature on a record you're gonna feature be real on a fucking political po- protest song about cops and, and society and shit and i was like it's perfect yeah be real is not gonna be spitting cryptic shit anyway he's coming straight at you so yeah you know it's, it worked for him for sure but as far as music wise i felt like it was it's pretty watered down for what it could have been like it's uh i don't know just wasn't feeling the the musical side of it but yeah i don't i actually don't mind this i think it's pretty much pretty much a theme for me it's like i don't know it just sounds like a watered down rage against the machine like the Mm -hmm. it just wasn't heavy enough just wasn't heavy enough man yeah and so much more yeah I, I get that i get that i actually really enjoyed this one because like i said you know when you're just gonna do something for face value i mean i mean i guess it doesn't have to be overly watered down i didn't really have that thought that it was watered down i just thought this was this was literally the first thing i heard off this record so i was like this is what i thought the record was gonna be like you know and yeah. then when, when you press play on the record and you hear cult 45 you're like <laughs> what the fuck that's nothing like fight and, and matter of fact like nothing up into this point in the record is like fight <laughs> to be no. honest really this one no. does kind of stand out on its own considering it's the first track so i could see why people if you didn't know what you're getting yourself into and you heard this song expecting fight throughout the record you'd be pretty disappointed in this album you know kind of thing but you know yeah. I, I like it for what it is it's it's not it's not making my top three on the album but i think it's effective for what it is and i think these are the type of songs that the album is trying to you know trying to voice right so yeah, yeah. uh track eight which is racist um <laughs> now this track is it, this is like vintage um feral montreat here mm. you know lyric wise right i mean yeah. he, you know i mean th- this is kind of what he does this is kind of what he yeah. does with lyrics and shit like that i mean um he's not really beating around the bush like he's he's not even trying to be funny he's not trying to be ironic here and stuff like that he's literally talking from the point of view of somebody being a racist so you don't have to beat around the bush when you say some shit you're unapologetic at the at these points right it's like you know like when i spit i do i do not use lies i co-create but you undeniably cope these rhymes and stuff and then he gets into he's like literally while i smoke in a pack of fags i will walk into a club and smoke a pack of fags it's like he's just telling you right there, man, like what he's doing. He's coming from the points of the racist and shit like that. And it's like, I mean, this is what so much of society the last couple of years has been, you know, just, this is what it's been about, man, you know, racism and all this bullshit and stuff. So why, why be subtle about what you're going to say in your rhymes and shit like that? Right. So yeah, he's definitely not subtle about it at all in this track. So no, I I love the way he did this. He he didn't, he didn't do a cryptic. He just, okay, I'm going to do this again. Like I did on, uh, uh, trick to the the, the phobia, <laughs> but I'm gonna I'm gonna rap from that point of view, and you know this is this is how it is. You know this is exactly how yeah. it is, and I I like that fact. So um, yeah, I like the way the drums came in on the third verse. It like took it up another level. I thought that was really cool the way they worked that out. You can hear the Sabbath influence on this track too. I think too. You know, just mm. that, that kind of 70s Sabbath and shit a little bit. So, I mean, I mean, they always cited like Sabbath and, and Zeppelin as the biggest influence of this type of record. So, you know, a little bit kind of slower mm. type, you know, kind of doom type shit and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it kind of makes yeah. sense where you can hear it. Um, but yeah, no, I, the drums are fantastic in this track. Really, really good stuff. Really good stuff. Yeah. Uh, track nine, which is Oxygen, which we did allude to off the top of the show. Did you want to get back into Oxygen? Uh. Yeah, I mean, we were just going over like the lyric wise what it was, but uh, and uh, he he did some singing on this one, and I I didn't really enjoy his singing on this track at all. But uh, it's not not one that I would probably go back to. 
you know what? This song right here, yeah, I I'm not overly the biggest fan of this either. Um of the uh of the chorus. Um Yeah. But man, dude, I actually do like the like the bass line in this and there's some other sounds in here that sound exactly like it, it, I don't know if they know who Fabio Frizzi is. He did the music for like a lot of Italian films and shit, like in the beyond be one of my favorites and stuff, but there's like some sounds in here, baseline, um, other kind of like, uh, keyboard sounds and shit that are in here. That sounds super Italian, like Italian influence and shit. And like, oh, okay. it, it, it caught me right away. I was like, Holy shit, dude. It's like kind of like, I don't know, like the, the music itself was really good, but his kind of like lo-fi course, I don't know, man. I wasn't really, I wasn't really feeling that either, to be honest. But the, the the song overall, I actually do like. I like the, you know, obviously the message and stuff. But the the actual arrangement, of the music, I thought was actually really cool. And this again, it kind of goes back to the, you know, the dark theme of this and shit. But I couldn't help but hear, not hear the the Fabio Frizzi influence in this. And it's crazy, man. It's crazy. Completely sounds like it. So, yeah. um. So yeah, I didn't recognize that at all. So yeah, that's no, pretty cool. that was the first time I listened to the record. That was the first thing I noticed. I'm like, oh, that's really crazy. Because like, I listen to Italian soundtracks all the time, right? And that's a, and yeah. so right away I was like, bam, dude, holy shit, that's great. It kind of sounds like you know that's where they were got their influence, which is totally cool with me. I mean, yeah. hence yeah, the music definitely. that Fabio Frizzi usually did was you know he worked on a lot of horror films and stuff, right? So you're gonna have that kind of darkness to it. So it fit, it fit. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, track ten is Kill 'Em All Again. Uh, another track that he actually does kind of um, vocalize in the uh, in the course. Yep. Yeah, I actually like that. Like the way he worked this one out. It's a, uh, it's more of like, not a poppy sound, but uh, it's just more of a catchy singing melodic type sound. When he has, I kind of found myself singing along with it. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty cool song. Yeah, this one's actually pretty cool, man. Um, I, you I know, like the lyrics too. It's really cool. The lyrics on this, of course. But... I guess we like the lyrics on every song, basically. <laughs> it, it is cool, man, because again, this one, he really goes into like the whole kind of metaphorical witchcraft and voodoo and, you know, you know, the whole number 13 thing. And he's kind of right into that in this one, man. Um, yeah, cool. I like the uh, Instagram reference he has, like you're, it says you're caught in a spell with no plans to see the bigger picture and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I, I like this track. It's probably one of my favorites on there. <clears throat> yeah, this is a cool track, man. Um, again, I actually thought the chorus was, you know, pretty de- pretty decent. This, but I, you know, I love just the metaphors that he uses and like straight up, man. Like, <clears throat> what's what's the line? He's like inauthentic, addicted to the internet affirmation, quintessential assholes, mentally masturbating. It's awesome, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good shit, yeah, man. I mean, right. that line just, you know, it kind of s- says a lot right there. But um, yeah, get into track 11, which is called The Exorcist. Uh, again, you know, we sound like broken records, but the verses are so fucking dope on this track, man. Um, and I love the, the chorus in this, man. It, it kind of reminds me of fucking cocaine, man. You know, when cocaine will do like courses and shit for people for some odd reason man it was coming off as like this cocaine vibe man i was like this is cool man it's a really really dark song um i kind of like that he's like using the exorcist metaphor as like exercising society you know to rid the evil and the hatred and all that type of shit and um you know to kind of like fucking if you could exercise society and start all over again, man. Isn't that ideology just fucking crazy? You rid the racism, you rid the hate and all the bullshit, yeah. all the garbage. And you just, you get everyone on the same playing field. And it's like, wow, that's a, a very interesting idea. You know, he's not yeah. literally talking about exercising one person. He's talking about exercising the whole world. That's, it's crazy. It's kind of crazy. So. Yeah. Yeah, definitely lyric wise, top notch, of course. But I wasn't really feeling singing on this one. It's a little bit different. And I found the guitars were kind of aimless, but. Yeah. yeah, I actually Other thought the chorus was one of my favorites on the record for some odd reason, just because yeah, I was yeah. instantly, maybe it's because I was listening to, to Cocaine's first album like about a week or two ago. Oh, and really? it, I had that, I had, even though he doesn't really, he doesn't do a lot of that on that record. It was just having Cocaine's, you know, verses and yeah. his voice, like in my mind, yeah. I started yeah, thinking I that. Actually. But like, I know like when he did, um, oh, it was Snoop's record on uh, on No Limit there, um, The Last Meal. 
the last meal that he did. Well, cocaine must have done like 80% of the courses on that record. I don't even think he raps. I think he does all the courses. It's fucking crazy. He was kind of like yeah. Buster Rhymes on that record, just doing courses left and right. But I always remember that record because it's like, oh, it's the cocaine one where he was on every track. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's yeah. like, but yeah, he instantly just kind of reminded me of that. So, yeah, that's um, funny. but yeah, I don't, I actually think that song is pretty cool. But uh, next track is uh, um, Amnesia um yeah. th this one right here the whole vibe completely changes the whole record up to this point the first 11 tra tracks you know basically kind of support that whole kind of doom dark feel to it with the exception maybe fight doesn't i mean that's a different type of song but yeah but this was like the ballad on the album <laughs> right 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 <laughs> you know it's it's the feel good track it almost it almost has the feel good feel to it which is really like i said you know when i said this album would have been really really good if it had a stock track 11 you know the last two tracks i yeah. feel aren't really my favorites i feel like the 13 track is is just like an album filler filler like we need something to just kind of end the album on but it made sense yeah. that they put the song at the end of the record too because it didn't you know i feel like if this was placed at number three or four in the album it would have just kind of broke up that feel yeah. and stuff so yeah, it does it, it does make it, sense yeah. where they put it and shit like that you know again you know listen to yeah. lyrics and stuff are really good and stuff but it's it's not honestly not really a favorite of mine i didn't really like the chorus in this at all um the arrangement yeah. of the music and stuff is just it is what it is it just doesn't really do a whole lot for me yeah yeah me either but uh, again the lyrics were interesting so yeah right that's the thing with with uh, when you have an album like this like even like a lot of it i don't enjoy musically but just the lyrics like you'll go back and read the lyrics and it's like it gives you some replay value that way if nothing else you know on it honestly that's kind of like listening to you know, a, a modern or like a one of the two Eminem records that came out last year. If you don't like the music, you can't help it. If you if you're listening to what he's saying and you're following along and shit, you're like, dude, I, like you know, he's he's an isolated introvert. He's a weirdo and shit. But man, dude, that guy can fucking spit some shit, right? You, you almost want to listen to it again just yeah. to hear what he's saying because like it's ridiculous. It's yeah. it's honestly ridiculous yeah. his flows and what he's doing and shit. And I can see yeah. where you're coming from on this too musically. You know, it's like. Um, and I'm not even saying I, I didn't like, I actually liked those records, those Eminem records from last year, to be honest. It was kind of, I, I yeah, figured, it, I figured it was the best stuff he'd done in years, you know, and his previous couple records yeah. were just, they were bad. They were really, really bad, but yeah. I felt like he came a little bit more correct on that. But again, using that as, uh, as a contrast, you know, it's very much the same thing. Yeah. It's like, you know, musically, you know, sometimes it could be very indifferent from here and there, beat song to song and stuff. It's like the M records too. I get that. You know, I didn't like every beat on them either. So, um, yeah. but yeah, no, Amnesia, eh, it's, and then the kind of the last track, uh, kill, kill, kill with featuring Smithsonian who I've never heard of. I mm -hmm. assume it's the, the, the girl that's comes in singing on the uh, last half of the track, but, uh, yeah. I thought this was a bit of a mess musically. <laughs> like it was just a little bit of experimentation gone wrong. I think um, you know it gets a little atmospheric, and but yeah, I just I didn't like this track at all. Really, it's weird. It's like it's one of these tracks where it feels so damn progressive. But I agree, it's like a mess. the The whole music yeah. it feels very very messy. There's a long kind of really kind of breakdown to it. I don't know. It's like I I kind of took the track as like you know kill 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 i don't really know exactly where this is even really coming from i just kind of took it as like you know our revolution is going to continue hence the progressiveness of the of the music and stuff and i was like hey this is how we're going to leave you off but yeah. instead of like completely ending the record and the movement we're going to leave you with this and it's you know it's, it's supposed to progress into something else like another album kind of yeah. thing that's just how I, my brain operated but yeah, on, yeah honestly sure. when i when i find myself listening to this record it was like i get to track 11 and i'm like okay the album's over <laughs> you know it's like yeah i just track 12 and 13 i just i feel like they're yeah. they're album fillers enders and you know yeah, and, i agree with that for sure yeah so it, you know the album doesn't end the greatest but uh you know overall man i i think it's pretty damn solid i mean after listening to it so many times and stuff it's like every song is just like flooded in my mind right now you know it's like I've just had an overload of the record. I think my wife listened to it like six times this week with me. So she's yeah. like, what the fuck are you yeah. listening to all the time? She's like, never <laughs> listen to albums that much. Um, yeah. I just thought maybe like it, as a beginning, it's a, it's a pretty okay starting point for them, but it's, it's, it does seem like it's a bit of an experimentation stage, maybe to what they thought it was going to be, to what, it, what this turned out to be, to maybe what they're going to progress to. It could be totally different, but 
Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting record for sure. It's lyric wise or you know, awesome. Like we say, the drums are banging on this, like perfect drums on this. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I'm interested to see what they come out with next, just to see what what type of path they take. I'm actually quite interested to know when they actually recorded that song. If it was one of the last songs that they recorded, just to kind of put it on the record, could you imagine if you yeah, find out it was thought. if it was one of the first songs they did, and they're like, okay, well, we're gonna keep this, yeah. and then they end up doing this record, and you're just like, well, now we have to put this in there. It doesn't really fit the mold of what we're no. doing, so but we need another track on the record. I, I don't know. Yeah. Sometimes that happens. Maybe this right? one, maybe this one had more producer involvement in it. I don't know because, like you said, I'm not really certain on the production no. who, who worked on what song. So maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know. But yeah, definitely not something I would want to leave off the record with personally. You know, I always have this issue with, um, you know, with with movies and stuff when there's a movie that comes out with a very generic title. And it seems like every single year, there's always a couple movies that come out with the same title. So you go to search one of them and it's like the other movie always comes up. You're like, fuck. Yeah, dude, yeah. It's, it's so it's so damn annoying. Right. You're like, wow. So with this album, I'm trying to find production credits. Like I can't find the Discogs page for it. Like Wikipedia yeah, yeah. doesn't have one. I'm like, this is crazy. There's like no production credits because I always like the production credits. And yeah. so every time you search 13, it's the fucking Megadeth album. Number 13 yes. comes up every single that time. Happened, that happened to me as well. I'm like, you've got to be shitting me, dude. This is so infuriating. Yeah. I'm like, I just like give up, dude. I'm like, I can't find any information with the odd interview and stuff. But most of the stuff that yeah. I was reading, I'd heard Pharaoh talk about like on the on yeah. uh, Take It Personal a couple times. So I was kind of familiar, especially since he was just recently on Take It Personal on the year end show. So, and he was oh, talking good. about the record. So I, a lot of that interview was in my mind. It was pretty long too. Like he was on there just kind of, it's funny. They're like, they're like Pharaoh. So, you know, just let us know like what your favorite albums of 2020 were. And he goes, I didn't even listen to one album in 2020. I couldn't even tell you who even put out an album. He literally really? doesn't listen to music. And they asked him, they're wow. like, well, do you not listen to new music? Because while you're recording a record, you don't want that influence and stuff. And he goes, he goes, no, nah, man. He's like, dude, I just like have crazy ADHD and like, I can't fucking get through an album anyway. So I just stay away from music, dude. I'm doing my own thing. <laughs> well, that's interesting. I was yeah, like, I, never fucking... would have, I wouldn't have expected that for sure. Right. Nothing I was like, Jesus, because I've heard of artists, you know, while they're recording a record, they, they'll stay away from everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because it makes sense. Cause you don't realize sometimes how much you are being influenced by something that you're either yeah. seeing or hearing, like you're hearing, right. You might just accidentally put it in there subconsciously. Yeah. You don't even realize, but you know, and he's like, no, it's not the case. He's like, I just, I just do my thing. And like, I can't even get through albums anyways. <laughs> it's so yeah. fucking bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> so weird. Um, what do you think your top three tracks on the album would be? Uh, so I think my three favorite tracks on the album, uh, starting at number three would probably be Oxygen, uh, Goat's Head at number two. And then uh, 666 um, is probably my favorite track on the record. I like these three. They're very similar kind of in, um, I don't know, I, I guess in almost in almost in BPMs, you know, like they're a little bit slower and shit. Like I like that kind of that dark, slow, aggressiveness yeah. to tracks and stuff. When you, when you start speeding up the pace and BPMs go up a little bit, it's like, it loses me a lot. But hence like kill, kill, kill. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I'd probably go with six, six, six goat's head and kill them all again. I think would be my top three. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, overall good record. If you had to rate this out of 10, what would you possibly give this album? I'd probably roll with like a 6.5. I'm going to give it a... Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to come in at... I'm going to come in at a 7.5. I was higher at first, but the more I listened to it, and, you know, and just talking about it and stuff, and like like I said, though, like I think the last two tracks are complete misses for me. So I think right there, like it's, it's kind of a big hit on the album. Like, honestly, if the album had ended at track 11, I think the overall response for myself would have been so much greater right mm. because i just feel like those are still on they're still on the album you know it's like yeah it is what it is but i think the majority of the album does work for me and i like this darkness i like this approach to the record i like the content and stuff so there's a lot of positives here you know there's a few courses and things that i i you know i would have preferred to just have the breakdown and with no vocals you know maybe at times it just could simplify it a little bit more and stuff but but yeah. even with that said i don't think any of the courses are are like I don't know what the appropriate word is like just almost shitty I don't know like I don't think any of them are just like to the point where it's like oh my god that's so bad so gaudy and yeah. shit but yeah. um, 
cringeworthy is kind of the word I'm thinking, you know, and sometimes with these type of records, man, that's what happens in courses and shit. Like that's yeah. what really can separate songs, man, is you cringeworthy chorus. And you're just like, no, yeah, it's done. Yeah. It's done, man. So yeah, especially where, you know, Pharaoh's a rapper. He's not known as like a great vocalist or anything. So like singing wise, but uh, right, right. yeah, I, I do like his voice though. I think he has potential. It's just, it's just uh, they haven't explored what they're doing enough as yet. I don't think it seems like they kind of get together and and they did this and mm-hmm. this is how it how it turned out. But uh, it might not have been to their potential for sure. That's why I'm looking forward to what's next for them. So uh, as far as uh, I've heard from him is that he put group show and fairly soon from what he said as well. Like he's not going to be another six seven year wait. So. We'll see what happens. Well, that's good, man, because you can hear, like, like we talked about, you can hear the enjoyment that he's getting out of MC. And like, I mean, you don't just come yeah. up with these lyrics and have this type of, you know, this type of approach to a record and not be, you know, into it again. You know, and I think yeah. that's, that's the thing. Like, I mean, you know, from a fan's perspective, we're, I mean, we're almost kind of, I don't, I don't even really know how to say it, but I mean, we, we want more. We always want more, mm-hmm. but I mean, guys like Pharaoh Monch is like, you know, he's very much perfectionist. Like he wants to write the perfect shit. He wants to put in the time and stuff. And I have respect for that, you know, like going back to the whole yeah. quantity over quality thing, man. I mean, he is taking a little bit long. It's like, it's like the whole black thought thing, right? Black thought yeah. has been putting out these EPs and shit, which is cool. But I mean, yeah. I think every fan really wants to see that album. You know, I mean, it's been a long yeah. time coming kind of thing. It's like, it's just in that aspect. I mean, I guess as fans, we're a little bit selfish in that aspect. Like we want the material, but you got to remember, they still got to do it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I think it's a pretty solid album for, you know, for what it is and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I was happy that we did this for episode one and stuff. So uh, I don't yeah, know. What, definitely. I don't know what we're going to be doing for episode two. I mean, if you guys have any ideas down below, just or not even for episode two, we'll probably come up with something, but just have any ideas for the show. Like I said, we're open to doing pretty much anything. I, I, I mean, I don't want to you know, just stick to one thing, just kind of do something here. And I'm pretty sure Jay's down for a lot of different type of things too. And suggestions down below are always welcome. Always welcome. So it's the bake sale, baby. Yeah, man. We just, we're open. We're open. I and didn't we, even know you were going to use that for sure as the title because we discussed it, but I didn't know yeah. that you were actually going to use it. Well, the more I thought about it, I, I was like, it actually actually is, it's short, it's catchy, and I'm just like, why not, yeah. right? And it's perfect to yeah. say, you know, like, we're open, we're open for business, we got lots of goodies in store, and it's like the bank sound, <laughs> it's like, it's kind of corny, it's kind of cheesy, but at the same time, it's like, but that's what the the point is here is is about variety and stuff, right? So it just made perfect sense to do it, so. Yep, but. Definitely. uh but yeah, that's going to conclude episode one here on the bake sale. That's 13, a magnificent day for an exorcism, uh, 2021. It is out digitally. Uh, I believe the, actually, I'm not even hundred percent sure when the vinyl, I think the vinyl is coming out first. It's, it's weird because back in the day it used to be like, you always had to wait on the vinyl or something like that. And now it's like yeah. vinyl and they're not even dropping on CD anymore. It'll probably come out on cassettes. Yeah. <laughs> right. So we're just, yeah, so, cassettes have taken over. It is. It's so crazy. At least, at least they're not like getting crazy with the prices, like with tapes, you can still get them for actually cheaper than you were paying for them back in the day. Which is yeah. kind of interesting that they're yeah. so niche now and then you're paying less money for them. But yeah, yeah. so that's why I end up with, you know, a couple ones from last year. But yeah, anyways, I digress. So we'll figure out something for episode two here. We're not going to have a specific schedule. So we'll, we'll upload these whenever we do them. And uh, hope you guys enjoyed. Leave your comments down below on what you thought about the album. And we're out of here. Deuces. <laughs>